know, what I want to know is is how how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. I had finally gotten to a point with my injured finger on my right hand that I was going to have to go and see a doctor and I I went to a hand surgeon that I had actually gone to back in like 2002 or sometime and he was still in operation and I was still in their system thank goodness so I didn't have to jump through all those hoops but uh, they did an x-ray and he walked into the room and he sat down and he said, I said, did I break it? And he goes, sister, you crushed it. And he pulled up the x-ray on the computer screen and there was my thingy with a piece of bone that had basically been broken off and was pushing out of the side. And I knew that it had this horrible knot and, uh, So he told me that I'm going to have to have surgery and that they'll go in and clean all that out and then put a pin in it and that I won't be able to bend the fingertip, but I will be able to bend the knuckle joint. So at least that was the silver lining that I won't be completely, you know, I don't know. It was just, it was very discouraging because it it was, I was still in a lot of pain and I was still really trying to work and uh, it just been really kind of an an annoying thing, but but at least it explained why it continued to hurt. Um, But I was driving back into town, back into Asheville on a Sunday. I'd gone to see a couple of friends and I was on my way back and and I had been uh, talking to Helen back and forth over that weekend a little bit and she had told me about her uh, nine year long relationship which she had never really spoken that much about and I think it maybe took this long to just you know get to a place where she felt like she could trust me to tell me about it and she had met this woman in London and uh, the woman was, I guess, half American, half English. I think one of her parents was from the U.S. and the other one was from uh, from London. Uh, but she'd met this woman and they got into a relationship and then that woman uh, went back to Greece with Helen and was living there at her family house, which sounds kind of like a compound at times. It's I think it's just a huge... Uh, a very huge house and it's sort of set up that way and I think that uh, maybe a lot of European families live more com- like more commune style than we do here uh, but she told me that you know they had a pretty tight relationship and they had traveled all over the place and and uh, you know she had really let this woman into her life and then uh and then the woman basically robbed her blind and took everything from her. Uh, I think they had some joint bank accounts, but she ruined her financially. And uh, Helen's father had to step in and take legal action and really went looking for this woman and uh, to try to recoup, and they couldn't. 
and Helen felt so guilty. She said that it was just horrible. And her dad uh, passed away two years later. But during that time, he was really fighting to try to recover what had been taken. And Helen just felt so guilty. She said that it was just this guilt was overbearing. And, you know, it all sort of made sense to me then about the the struggle. She said she'd gotten so depressed, but that's when her family came through and gave her the ring. And so anyway, um, you know, we just got to talking a lot about that and, and how relationships sometimes can just wreck you, you know, and especially when you trust to that degree, you know, you trust that person like they're like your family and then to, to be betrayed like that is just it's, it can be just devastating um but we had a few good laughs and good talks and stuff and um and then you know it was so funny she asked me this question you know she said if you had to choose between going naked or having your thoughts appear in a thought bubble of above your head where everyone could read which would you choose and I'm like, what? So if I had to choose between going naked or having my thoughts appear above my head for people to read, and I instantly said, oh, going naked would have to happen. And I laughed. I said, because, you know, I have some pretty controversial thoughts, girl. And she laughed and said, I would go naked in seconds. And and we got a good laugh out of that. Um and the, during the last week of January, it was a very powerful weekend for me. Um, I had dreamed that I saw her across a cobblestone street, and there were two gas lanterns on the outside of this building, and I saw her from the back. I didn't see the front, and but she was wearing this long blue kind of wool trench coat, looked like a Burberry of London type coat or something, and these sort of like those uh, equestrian riding boots, real classy. She was real classy looking, and so it was at nighttime, and I could see her, and I crossed this cobblestone street, and when I got up beside her, she was looking at a menu board, you know, that was on the outside of this building, and she didn't turn around or anything, and I, I took my arm, and I pointed, and I said, I hear that's pretty good, and I pointed at the menu, and then she turned to me and looked at me, and I woke up, and I woke up real fast, and it was like, <gasps> you know, and my heart was kind of beating, and I was like, whoa, and and I think that was like on a Friday night or something, or maybe a Saturday morning, um, and then during the day, I started watching some uh, YouTubes on Greece and the area in which she lives and where her, their house is. And I, I watched a bunch on Patras and I looked up some of the vineyards. I was just so curious, you know. It had been so long we'd been talking. I had all these mental pictures. I felt like I was getting to the edge, like I really want to go there, like I really, I'm ready to meet her, I'm ready to go there, I'm ready to visit Greece. I was just very um, excited about all of this, and uh, and so she sent me later, she said they were going, her and her daughter were going to go out for a girl's night, and uh, going out to dinner, and, and her, her daughter's boyfriend was coming, and uh, the head farmer and, and a couple of other of her daughter's friends. And I said, well, send me some pictures, you know, when y'all get there, whatever. And so later she sent a few pictures of them at the table and and uh, they looked like they were having a good time. And uh, and then she, she commented that, you know, some of them were drinking Coca-Cola. And we got in this whole talk about Coca-Cola. Oh, my God. And I told her, you know, the history of Coke. She didn't know. And I said, well, being from Atlanta, you kind of learn all about Coca-Cola. And I told her about how the original recipe, you know, had cocaine in it. And she was like, what? You know, and I explained all that to her. And it was really a funny conversation. And I said, you know, when you come, 
we're going to go to Atlanta and I'm going to take you to the world of Coca-Cola. And, uh, you know, it's like the Coke Museum. And it's really kind of fun. I mean, I don't drink Coke. I used to drink Diet Coke, but I gave all that up a long time ago. But it's still fun to go there because of the nostalgia. And it's just this huge museum. And and uh, and we were talking about that and stuff. And, and uh, you know, and then the conversation got got pretty serious, you know, and, and she just said to me, she goes, you know, babe, I, I'm looking for a long-term relationship. You know, I am in this for the long haul. Uh, I want to either die in my woman's arms or she dies in my arms or we go together. I want to see her through till the end or she sees me through to the very end. This was a very powerful moment for me. And then she asked me if I saw us together in 10 years. And I said, yeah, you know, if it's meant to be, um, it'll be. And then she told me that she had created a photo album <clears throat> and was going to send it to me. Um, and then I had sent her like a, a bunch of pictures, just different, uh, different pictures of myself through the years. And I, you know, I clarified on each one, like what year it was or how old or young I was. I didn't want to be misleading, you know. Um, and one of those pictures she sent back to me and, um, she said, you know, I've been looking at this picture a lot. You know, we were actually talking on the phone. I, I just remembered this. And she said, uh, you know, I've been looking at this a lot and I don't know, uh, babe, there is something about it that I, I really like, but I can't explain it. You look so focused. You know, I can see your passion for your work through this photo. It's amazing to me. And then she said, you know, babe, you will really enjoy exploring Europe. You know, we will go to the ancient cities from Athens, Sparta, Patras, Rhodes, Syracuse, then Prague, Venice, Rome, Romania, France, Austria. Uh, you know, it will give you even more insight and ideas with your work. And you are so creative. You know, you create images from your dreams then this will, you know, will add more to, to your imagination, basically. And she said, I plan to take you, you know. And then she told me, you know, you would like our home here. Your dad really put in a great work here. You know, I love to wake up and walk around and look at the trees with the birds flying around, just like it is here. But he built the house like he intended for the whole generation of family to live here for the future. And um, it just felt so inviting to me. And I was just uh, really intrigued with the whole thing, you know, and the love that I was feeling toward this person and this, this life and this, uh, this scenario that had been laid out in front of me, I was, I was sort of an overwhelm, but in such a good way, you know, and, uh, all the music I'd been sending her, we had all this soundtrack going, it was like the soundtrack of a lifetime, and there was this one song called, uh, I think it's Charcoal Baby, and it's, uh, I think the group is Blood Orange or something like that. It's a really cool song. And Chris Isaacs, I Can't Help It. There's just so many cool songs that, that we were kind of sending back and forth. I was not only infatuated, but I was deeply, deeply moved by all the conversations and pictures and images that I had in my mind and the beauty uh, that I saw in all these different pictures she'd sent me that I really, really felt like uh, my life was unfolding in such a beautiful way. And I really wanted to tell people and we were supposed to start a new job uh, at this Airbnb over in Leicester and, and, uh, 
I don't know, I heard that snow was in the forecast, but I had this window of time that this job had been on my schedule uh, for a year. And this company that owned this Airbnb, it was a pharmaceutical research company, and they were based in Columbus, Georgia. And I had never met the owner, and his wife had actually read an article about me in this Asheville Uh, some kind of Asheville online magazine. I don't even know what it was, but it was an article called Rad Women of Asheville. It was women that do, uh, that are in professions that are like men profession type of shit like that. And anyway, the wife had read this article and told her husband that I want her to do the stonework at this house. And so they had gotten on board, but like I said, it was a year before because it, we were so behind on this on my scheduling. I had so many jobs that it was, you know, first come, first serve. But with this Airbnb, they had this uh, window of time, and this is the window. You only have these two weeks and not weekends, and we would have to work Monday through Friday at noon. And we had to do a huge patio, a fire pit, a bench, and a bird bath. And this was a lot of work to try to do in a two-week period, to do it right, you know. But, uh, you know, I thought, oh, hell, here comes a snowstorm. How's that going to work? But, you know, I had emailed this uh, assistant, and I said, if it snows, do we? is there any extra time? And she said, no, this is it. You got this window of time. And I told the guys, I said, look, y'all, we might have to wear headlamps and get some night light out there because we've got to do this job in this amount of time. So anyway, uh, I was, you know, I was stressing a little bit about that, but not too much. I, I had kind of gotten real detached from the work, the the stress of the work, because I had this, I had this love affair. I had this love affair going on in my life, and I really didn't give a shit that much about the work stress. That makes it like, you know, it just makes it not that big of a deal. It's kind of like, ah, eh, whatever, you know, I got something so good happening in my life, I could care less, like, you know, meeting their, my obligations, like I, you know, it's all I've ever done is fucking meet my obligations. So the next morning, it was very early. uh, And I woke up and I didn't feel, I felt a little bit unsettled and it was probably about 3.30 a.m. And I woke up and I was just laying here in the dark and my phone dinged. And it was a text, and it was Helen. And it said, uh, babe, please text me when you wake. And I text back, and I said, hey, I'm up. What's up? And she said, did I wake you? And I said, no, I was awake. I said, how are you doing? And she said, oh, well, you know, I'm not doing very good, babe. Honestly, I'm kind of stuck, and in a way, I'm very exhausted. And she had been having some trouble with her back. And, you know, Helen never complained about anything. Like, she had mentioned her back, you know, through this four, four and a half months, uh, off and on. And I had suggested, you know, have you ever gone to a chiropractor um, or massage or things like that? But I knew that, that, and she thought, too, that it was mostly from stress and coming from her neck and shoulders And just all the worrying about, you know, but she didn't, like I said, she wasn't negative. She remained very optimistic through this whole time. And so um, the week before she had mentioned to me that she had some meetings during that week with some of her dad's attorneys and some of the, um, she called them financiers. I guess she meant like bankers. I'm not sure, but that she was having a lot of meetings with some legal matters and stuff uh, in the city. And she had texted me on her drive back and forth and stuff. But so anyway, you know, I'm just like, well, what's going on? Because it was early, you know, and and of course it wasn't as early there, but uh, it was early for me. And I was supposed to start this new job and all that. Um, But she said, you know, oh, well, you know, fixing all these machines and replacing what we could and buying all the cables. I still have, 
you know, she said she still had uh, more machines to buy and that the work, you know, so that the work could actually go well. And then she said that she had exhausted uh, the initial check from Guinness. And then she said she was overdrafted and she needed to buy six more machines. Um, that, that this would, it would be ideal so that she could just catch up with time. And, um, and then she said that she was going to run way behind time if, if she couldn't get these machines. And then she said that the banks had been frustrating because of all their like high and unrealistic interest. Um, but she had gone to meet with her father's attorney uh, over the trust funds. And then they reminded her that uh, she's got another two years before she can ex- access those funds. And that the least they could do, um, you know, which would it would take a lot of paperwork and a lot of processing time. The least they could do is a hundred thousand dollars, and not any more than that. And then she told me that she was expecting another check uh, from the company in like a month, but that waiting for either one of these uh, was going to just put her even more, even further behind. Uh, you know, she said, I'll run behind schedule, which is bad for the contract, babe. You know, she said that relatives had been supportive and had invested, but uh, but she said it was really on her now. And then she said, I don't know what to do, babe. And I said, I asked her, I said, what kind of machines? You know, how much product do you have ready for Guinness? And how much are they expecting? And... As I was writing this or typing this or what have you, my heart began to pound in my chest. And it was that pounding like that used to happen to me uh, before something went wrong or before I was in danger it It wasn't the good kind of palpitation. It was like a scary, fearful palpitation. But I just kept reading and she came back and she said, you know, I need more fermenters and steamers and blenders and filters and pumps and more. You know, I have to order more cask and I have to cover the labor wages. You know, it's the welfare of the farmers. You know, they eat here. I have to feed them. And, you know, she had sent me a picture of the restaurant where they eat three meals a day. It was a picture of her standing in the restaurant. You know, she said, I, Jill, I've been able to fix the machines that we have, but they're just not as efficient as they used to be before. But, you know, adding more to the numbers, uh, it'll really help production. And she said that they only have only produced a thousand barrels, which means she says, which means I'm over eight thousand behind. That's very slow. She said that she needs more hands and more labor force as well as machines. And you know, I just I'm thinking, okay, okay. Uh, so I don't. I'm I'm kind of struggling. Like I don't know what to say. Because I'm having this physical, I'm having a physical reaction. And I don't know why my body is doing this, see. But I kind of do know why my body's doing this. So I asked, I said, have you told Guinness about these challenges? And she says, no, uh, I will not tell them, babe. It is not good on my end. Not advisable, babe. And I said, well, what do you think the solution is? And she says, well, yeah, babe, that's why I went to the bank to get a loan. You know, she said, I've got a bad record from the debt that my ex collected on my name with my signature. And then she kind of laughed out loud about that, uh, which I I can relate to that kind of disaster. But she said, you know, she'd paid 60% of that, uh, but having an outstanding loan pending you know, she just, I'm facing problems getting another loan, and the, it's just unrealistic. Uh, she said the interest rates were just insane and unrealistic. And, um, you know, she said that she had some money, but uh, not enough to finish 
to finish this until she got the next check. And she didn't want any delays in the production or any interruption of the worker's pay. And then she said, uh, babe, I know this sounds crazy, but I've really exhausted my options. I've really exhausted everything here, but I want to ask you if you can please trust me to give me a helping hand. And my body and my heart and my entire system felt like the morning when my little dog, Sissy, fell off the bed and I found her in the floor and she began to die and I began to go, no, 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 no. This started to happen to me. It said, I will pay you back with interest. I don't want to sit back and wait for the check. I'm certain to pay you back with interest. It would be like an investment in us. She says, I'm very confused. And I felt like this since yesterday. I want to get this right, Jill. And I, I... I continued, I, 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 I stayed calm, but I said, oh, wow, God, Helen, I wish I could help with this, but I, I have no extra money. Everything is in my business and, and making sure that my guys are taken care of. And even if I had it, uh, you know, I would help, but it's, but it's impossible. I just, I can't. And she said, oh, it's okay, babe. Uh, I'll keep trying. I understand. And I said, what would happen if you just pulled the plug and focused on other business? She says, you know, real adamantly, she says, I'm not going back. I'm not going back on this. It's my call. I'll fix it. I know it's tough, but I'll fix it. And it was like her tone changed, like really strangely. And then she said, you know, I'm sorry, to put you in a position like this. I just felt like I could share what was going on with me. You never know, you know, where any help may come from anyway. And I said, you know, I'm just so sorry, you know, and, and I was, I was starting to, I was starting to, uh, to melt. I was starting to melt in the floor. I felt like my body and my mind and my soul were going to just start to dissolve because my mind was racing so fast and so frantically trying to figure out if this was real or if this was a scam. And inside of my gut, Inside of my being, I knew it was a total setup. I didn't know what to do with this. I was in complete shock. I was in my kitchen and I was making a smoothie and I just, I kept, I kept making the smoothie and I, I, I kept trying to, uh, to give it what I could, um, I was like, okay, okay, I don't have money to help her. Maybe she'll get the money she needs. And on the other hand, I'm thinking, this is fucked up. This is this has a, been a buildup. This has been an entire an entire scheme. And I was very in between two worlds, I could not decipher reality. I really couldn't. And I didn't know what to do. And I had to go to work and, and there was snow on the ground. And, you know, she said, I'll text you later. Uh, I hope you have a good day. And I said, okay, you too. And I went ahead and I did my routine and I took a shower and then I called and I left her a voicemail. She didn't answer. And I said, hey. And I said, you know, uh, I'm really sorry that I can't help you with this. Um, you, you know that I would. And I sort of just went into this 
this place of, uh, I didn't really apologize, but I felt like I was trying to explain why I couldn't help. And I didn't get any kind of answer, response, or anything. And so we got to the job, went on to work, and the guys, we drove three different vehicles, and we had all this stone we had to take, and there's fucking snow and ice everywhere, and I had to go get ice melt. And I'm not kidding, my body felt like I was having a heart attack, whatever that feels like, I didn't know. And I started throwing ice melt out on this icy driveway because we were slipping and sliding and... And um, I told the boys, I said, y'all, uh, I got something I need to tell y'all, but w- w- I'll wait till lunchtime. You know, let's just wait till lunch. And and and, and I was throwing the ice melt, and all of a sudden, I, my feet went out from under me. I slipped. And in the sliding, I put my right hand down, the one with the crushed finger, to catch myself. And when I did, I, I kind of popped my shoulder And it was just this dramatic, traumatic moment. And I got up real fast and I was starting to cry. And I thought, I can't, I can't cry. I can't give this anything. Stand up. And I'm I'm literally taking one second and one breath at a time. Because I'm having this conversation inside of myself the entire time. Is this real? Is this real? Is this false? Is this a scam? Is this fucked up? Is this real? And and I'm I'm going crazy. I'm literally feeling like I'm gonna go crazy. And I'm I'm trying to work and I'm trying to do all this and uh, and the guys are like kind of wondering what the hell's going on with me. And so we started working and I was I was in a horrible place but I couldn't tell them because I just wasn't sure even what to say and I wasn't even sure if this was true or false and so uh, Wilkes built a fire in this like fire uh, one of those like freestanding fire pit kind of things and it was so cold and it was snow on the ground and we're having to shovel the fucking snow for this like 20 by 20 round patio and and how do you focus how do you focus on this kind of thing and, and i'm like okay let's shovel snow let's let's start digging and let's get the road bond and here we go and so by lunch you know we're, we pulled up chairs close to this fire because we're freezing our fucking asses off and we're sitting there and i i said i, I i'm just gonna read y'all this and i started reading them these texts from Helen. Now they know Helen. They know this whole story. And they're sitting and they're listening and they're like, and Joey starts shaking his head like, what? And they're both just silent and I'm reading it and we're looking at each other. And he's like, no, no. And they're both pretty confused and, and Joey's like me. He's like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe it's just, maybe she's just asking you for a loan. I mean, she trusts you enough and y'all have had this relationship long enough. Maybe she feels comfortable enough to ask you. I'm like, I don't know, Joey. I don't know, but, you know, $100,000? And, and, and I was so... I was so stuck, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't breathe. Well, we made it through the day, and I went home, and when I walked through the door, ding, my phone rang, my phone dinged, and it was her, and she said, are you home? And I swear to God, it was like, and I had said this a lot of times to Helen. I was like, do you have a spy cam on me? Like, do you know the minute I walk into my house? Because I swear to God, every time I walk in, it's like clockwork. I was starting to wonder, like, how does she know I just walked in my house? And I, I looked at the text, and I, I, I didn't know how to answer. I didn't know what to say. And all of a sudden... I had 
an experience come over me like I had had in the woods back in the 80s when these two old gross men took me out. They were going to give me a ride home and they actually took me out in the woods with a 12 pack of beer that because they wanted to show me something. And while we were in the woods, I knew I was in trouble with these two old men. And I was young. I was only 19 or 20 years old. And I remember talking excessively about my dad, who was about their age. And I kept just bringing up my daddy and talking about me and my dad had gone deer hunting. And I was just, and something came over me that was the same type of channeling. I don't know what you call it. And I text back and I said, yes, I'm home. And she says, how are you? I said, well, I'm not real good. I've got blurred vision and I've got a really bad headache. And I told her that I fell on the ice. And when I did, I said that I hit my head. I totally made up a lie that I had hit my head. And I said, I'm not feeling very well. I may have to go next door and get Joey. Well, she instantly comes back and says, you need to go get a scan. Can you go and get a scan? And I said, I'm going to go get Joey. And so I I checked out of that. I, I, I did not answer a text. I did not respond anymore. I just didn't do anything. And the next, she kept texting me, are you okay, babe? Are you okay? I need to hear from you. So the next day we go to work and I told the boys what had happened. And I told them, I said, I don't know what to do, y'all. I, I, I don't know what to do with this. I can't, I'm having such a hard time because I want to believe, I want to believe her. But I said, I know deep down I have a feeling this is this is bullshit. And I turned around and I started to I felt like I was going to collapse. And Joey grabbed me and he began to hug me and I began to cry. And he held me and then Wilkes came and he hugged me and Wilkes stood up very tall and he said, let me tell you something, Jill. He goes, if you go down, we go up. And he stood up real strong. And Joey and I kind of looked at each other and I almost laughed because it was so sweet and it was so cute. And I, I had this vision of this huge like gorilla you know, like, pounding his chest. And they both embraced me and they told me that they were here for me and it was going to be okay. And I started to lose it. I started to tell them. I said, "I, y'all, I can't. I can't. I can't do this anymore. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing this. And I held up my hand with this fucking splint and, you know, cast looking thing I had on my hand. And I said, I'm just, I'm physically beating myself to death to try to have a life. I've been beating myself to death to try to get to some place where I can have a life. And I said, this was my opportunity. I felt like this was the opportunity to have a life. And I was just unraveling. And those boys, they they stayed with me throughout the day. And I attempted to do some work and it was just shit. And I, you know, later they undid it, which I was glad. I couldn't focus. I couldn't think. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I couldn't sleep. And so I just, uh, I got home and I got another email. But these emails and these texts from Helen, it was like they weren't from Helen. It was like someone else had taken over, like some other entity had stepped in to go for the jugular. 
and it seemed very male. It seemed very male to me. It did not seem female at all. And so I finally got it together enough and and wrote back to one of the texts and I said I I'd gotten an MRI and that I had a head injury and that they were worried that I might have a brain bleed out and I just started making up shit at this point and whoever was on the other end of this says oh I'm sorry that happened to you well what do you think what do you think how are you f-? you know and it was like a total other entity it was cold and it was calculated and I I responded but I stayed in I stayed in this character and I just said oh you know I'll be okay uh I'm just so sorry that I can't help you and I kept on and on and on speaking as though I was speaking to my Helen to my love, to this person that I had this journey with. And I just kept explaining why I couldn't help and how bad I felt. And I said, you know, your, your life and your, um, your scale of your scope of work in this endeavor is so much more important than my life and it's so much more important than what I have going on and I know how important this is for you and uh, if I could help you I would you know I would and I just I played into this place because I did not want to I didn't know what to do and I shared this with a friend. I went and had had, had dinner with a friend and she kind of went to the far end of the world with it and said, you know, Jill, you don't know what has happened as far as with your phone and um, these scams, you know, she started kind of shedding a little light. I didn't know anything about scams. I didn't know anything about online dating scams or any of that. Well, I did a deep dive real fast and I started like reading about some of the stuff and I watched a documentary, you know, it was like the Tinder swindler that had just come out. Ironically, I was in a fucking whirlwind. I was in one of the strangest uh, eye of the hurricanes I'd ever been in. I thought I'd been in some fucking hurricanes. Well, this one was so psychically fucked up. I started looking into uh, these Nigerian scams. And what prompted this was the podcast, my podcast had gone into Nigeria on Christmas Eve. Well, Christmas Eve is when Helen was flying from Cork, Ireland, to Greece. And that's when she had listened to the podcast. She'd been listening, she said, from the U.S. all the way to Ireland and then all the way to Greece. Well, what was interesting was that during that that Christmas Eve night is when I went to bed and I checked the analytics because you can I could look at the analytics where the podcast goes. And I thought, that's interesting. Who in the hell's listening to this in Nigeria on Christmas Eve? Well, that popped up in my mind. And I was like, my God, maybe Helen of Greece is actually in Nigeria. And maybe she listened to this podcast to do her homework so that she could talk to me about it because she called me on Christmas night and that's when we spoke in depth about the podcast. My mind began to dissect and unravel everything that had been said and written over an almost five-month period of time. I was in another dimension. I was in a shock moment. It was as if 
It's that feeling you have right before you're about to have a car wreck. You know, like like if you have a car wreck, but say right before it happens, that kind of adrenaline that shoots through your body. Well, that is what my body felt like for days and days. And I could not shake it. I had no idea, I had no idea what was real and what was fantasy. Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammer.com, and follow us on social media for updates. <laughs>